Welcome back to the Food 52 Test Kitchen. Today we are braising daikon. The reason why this recipe works is because we're borrowing techniques from both Japanese and Chinese cooking to make a really delicious red braised daikon recipe. I think this is my go-to way to making sure that we get tender, flavorful, and not bitter braised daikon. The recipe today is called red braised daikon because we are borrowing a technique from Shanghainese or broadly Eastern Chinese cooking called hongshao. And hongshao literally translates to red braised. The idea and the color of this red comes from the different types of soy sauces that we use. It's not gonna come out really red, red, red the way Westerners think about the color red, but it is going to come out with deep, what's another word for red? Magenta, sorta? Of. Deep. Ruby, crimson, deep red brownish color. And that red braising is going to include three different types of soy sauce to give us a well-rounded, interesting flavor. First things first, daikon. Daikon is a Japanese word. Daikon refers to large root. This is a type of radish. So, sort of like a turnip, and they're delicious and they're very sweet. Sometimes they're pickled. If you've clicked on this video, you probably already know what a daikon is. However, you may often run across the problem of daikon coming out quite bitter. There are a lot of steps that you can take, steps that I learned from my host parents when I was studying in Japan. Um, and when I was cooking there at fancy restaurants, they use similar techniques to take out of that bitterness. Now, as always, the quality of your dish starts with your ingredients. If you have nice young daikon that hasn't been sitting around for too long, hasn't been stored improperly, you will more likely come out with a sweet, delicious daikon dish. But these steps will give you a larger margin of error so that you come up with a delicious product. With daikon and related turnips and radishes, there are different species or different types. You'll find some that are pink, you'll find them some that are a little bit green on the top. The most common type of daikon you can find in the US, um, they're basically these white daikons. You want as little green on the top as possible. Um, you also want the stem to not be totally dried out because that's an indication of freshness. And most importantly, when you buy them, you want to make sure that they're nice and firm. If you press onto them and they don't, and they even sink a little bit, that's not very fresh daikon. We're gonna take the tops off. This to the side. We're gonna take the bottoms off to the side. This center part is the best part, but not only this center part, but the center center part in the center. What we're going to do is we're going to be peeling it, but we're going to be peeling it a little bit more than you think. So when you peel daikon, here's the thing. You will find that the center is a slightly darker color and you're going to see veins. You, you need to get to that layer. The f a lot of the bitterness in the daikon lives on the outside surface, so you want to actually genuinely peel more than you think to get to that veiny layer. Now, it is prudent not to waste food, so this outside peel easily can be made into your favorite daikon pickles. Nice and smooth, super consistent, no more outside peel visible. Okay, so when you're peeling it, you'll notice that daikons might smell a little bit farty, especially if you pickle it with all that bitterness on, that's what's gonna happen. So we've taken a good amount of it off. Now we're going to cut them into nice little pieces. So we, I, I like these to be nice and neat, so I'm looking for anywhere between one and a half inch to two inches, but I'm also kind of cutting them based on the diameter of the daikon itself. And I really enjoy when, if you can get the pieces a very similar, if not a same width, they can all stand at the same height. Oh my God, Lucas, actually do it properly then. The middle one seems a little taller than Wow. <laughs> similar enough. Zero Michelin stars. So that's a daikon cut into wedges. And then we're going to use another Japanese home cooking technique, which is called the hidden cuts. We're going to cut little X's or crosses into one side of the daikon. And when we serve this, we're gonna serve it upside down. What this does is it gives us a little bit more surface area to soak in that liquid and soak in that flavor. One of those not absolutely necessary steps, but because it comes out of tradition and it actually has purpose, I like to take the time to do anyway. 
This is one of those very, very simple home cooking dishes. Really requires a little bit more attention to detail to make it extraordinary. And then last step for the prep, we are going to, there's a carpentry term for this. Someone look it up for me. I believe it's chafer, chamfer, which is a carpentry term for what I'm about to do. So we're taking the edge off with the Y peeler like so. This does two things. Number one, it gives it a little bit more structural integrity. And number two, because it's a little bit rounded, when these pieces of rod daikon bump into each other, they won't chip off larger chunks, so they'll look a little bit neater. So um, daikon is a very, very popular vegetable in a lot of East Asian and Southeast Asian, or generally Asian countries, and they're quite easy to prep. But in this context, where we're just really trying to highlight the natural sweetness of that daikon flavor with a little bit of this red braised sauce, I really like taking these extra steps. Um, by the way, traditionally, daikon is also one of the vegetables that are used to test um, chef's knife technique. And one of the techniques, um, which I won't be able to do with a cleaver because it's a cleaver, is you should be able to peel all of that with just moving the cleaver up and down. And the second step is to um, take off the edge with your knife at an angle like this. Um, because tra traditionally there wouldn't have been peelers. Um, it is pretty hard to do with a cleaver of this size because it's the wrong knife and it's not a Japanese knife, but you get the idea. Before we do our first cook, I'm just going to process the rest of our aromatics that we will use for the second stage of the cooking. Now, garlic, ginger, and scallion, typical stuff. We're using this in a braise. We're probably not going to eat the pieces of garlic, ginger, and scallion itself. So we just have to get them ready for flavor activation. So our ginger, we're going to take most of the peel off. Uh, we're gonna cut this into pieces that can stand up relatively, and then we're going to smash it just to get that flavor going and call it a day. Cool. Garlic, same thing, smash it to get that peel off. We are not going to mince this finely because we want to keep these garlic pieces whole so that we can take them out later. And then finally, the scallion, take the roots off, flatten them, cut them into segments. We're, fl we're flattening the scallion because the scallion will sit a little bit more flatly on the cutting board and we're helping burst some of those cell walls, but that's mostly just like, it's not gonna make a big difference. It's just habit. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the end of our aromatics, garlic, ginger, and scallion. We can set that aside because that's going to be another 30, 40 minutes from now. And first things first is we're going to simmer our daikon. Now, simmering the daikon. Another little secret tip out of tradition here is a little bit of rice. You can use leftover rice water if you have it from washing rice. You can also use leftover rice that you have and just throw them in the pot. But this is a traditional Japanese home technique of simmering daikon with rice. When you simmer daikon with rice, the idea is it removes some of the bitterness. I think it's less scientifically about removing the bitterness out of the daikon, rather that if there is any bitterness that leaks into the liquid, the starch, thanks to the rice, will help absorb it and prevent it from being reabsorbed back into the daikon. Rice and daikon is in the pot. We're going to cover it with water. Try to cover it at least by half an inch or an inch so you have a sufficient amount of water. And then we're going to bring it to a boil. Cold pot, cold water, cold daikon, cold rice. Bring it up to a boil, turn it down to a simmer, let it simmer for maybe about at least 30 minutes. At this step, we're trying to cook the daikon pretty much almost fully. It's been about 30 minutes for this daikon. It's simmering. Uh, I like covering them just to preserve some of the heat uh, if your stove is a little bit weak. Um, you can also simmer them uncovered if you want to see what's going on in the middle. But uh, now you can see that the rice has blossomed, so to speak. Um, it, has become basically kanji. And if you really wanted to know whether this rice technique works, you would taste the liquid. And according to the theory, the liquid would be a little bit bitter, which it is. How do you know if your daikon's ready at this stage? Take it out. Your chopstick should go in very, very easily. And then it should slide off. Okay. so. Our daikon is ready. Since we took the took the care to cut everything to this to a similar size, we can assume that the rest of the daikon is also similarly cooked. We're just going to take all of it out. Now, after this, we are going to start our pan for our red braise. Different types of soy sauce, all of our aromatics. 
Okay, let's braise this daikon. We're doing a red braise. Again, the red braise is from Shanghai, Eastern China. Today, this is a modified version of that. We're using a couple of different soy sauces to tell you what's going on inside of the pot, and we're going to be activating our aromatics. While this pot is heating up, I would like to introduce a fourth aromatic into the mix. This is Sichuan peppercorn. Sichuan peppercorn uh, hails from Sichuan and it gives you a little bit of a numbing flavor, but it is also nice and citrusy. So a little bit will go a long way. We're using it today to, just to give it another dimension of flavor. Now this is not a spicy dish, but I like using Sichuan peppercorn sparingly um, in situations like this to give you a little bit more of a complicated, complex mouth feel. Soy sauce. I think that the easiest way for most beginners to categorize soy sauce is into three large categories. The first is light soy sauce, the second is dark soy sauce, and the third is what I call seasoning soy sauce. Light soy sauce is here. It is salty, soy flavor. This is primarily for sodium and for soy flavor. Second is dark soy sauce. Dark soy sauce is made traditionally after light soy sauce. After the light soy sauce is extracted, um, the soy sauce is allowed to continue to ferment and it picks up lar more of a molasses, darker, deep color, which is why it's used primarily for color. The third, not in most kitchens, is what is called seasoning soy sauce. Now there are a couple of soy sauces that fall into this category, but seasoning soy sauce or seasoned soy sauce is soy sauce that has other ingredients added to it for a more interesting or perhaps ready to go experience out of the bottle. Sometimes seasoned soy sauce will be doctored specifically for seafood. In that category, seasoning soy sauce also tends to have a higher um, savory component. Um, and for this type of seasoning soy sauce, you're looking for a very specific type of bottle popularized by the Maggie brand. It's highly umami, highly savory. The way I teach cooks is that basically it's like soy sauce, but like extra savory, extra MSG. My ratio here, by the way, roughly, between the three soy sauces and the oyster sauce and the sugar is two to two to two to two to one. In this recipe, it's a tablespoon of light soy, a tablespoon of dark soy, one tablespoon of seasoning sauce, one tablespoon of oyster sauce, and half a tablespoon of sugar. Generally, that kind of gives me a good starting point. In our pot, it's heated up, a little bit of oil on the bottom, wait for that to shimmer, and the ginger is going to go in first because it is the least likely to burn. Second, scallions. Third, garlic. Wait for it to smell good and cook it until it picks up nice color. Sichuan peppercorns are going to go in. Mix, mix, mix. Let everything toast. Let that oil spread everywhere to activate all of that flavor. If you don't do this part correctly, your sauce is not as flavorful as it could be. You can start to smell some of that spice, some of that Sichuan, some of that nice citrusy notes. Scallions are starting to break down, they're starting to caramelize. Garlic's picking up a little bit of a golden amber color, as is the ginger. Okay, now we're seeing a good amount of golden brown color. We're going to very carefully pour cold water into hot oil. Watch for the splatter, because you're putting water into the pot. All that stuff together. Into this pot goes our soy sauces and oyster sauces. Light soy, dark soy for color, seasoning, for the third dimension, oyster for body, and our sugar, which is white sugar, what I believe to be basically rock sugar substitute. Mix all that together. You'll see now that you have a beautiful dark brown liquid. We call it red braising, but that dark soy sauce in the traditional Chinese culinary way is red. Now that our mixer has come to a boil, our daikon is going to go in. Throw that up so it's evenly distributed. And we're going to let this simmer for about 30 minutes, which should be enough time for it to really absorb all of that flavor. And we're going to simmer this uncovered to let the sauce reduce just a little bit. After 30 minutes, the daikon is finished cooking. It's absorbed all of that flavor and our sauce has reduced by a tiny bit. The next step is to take the daikon out, ready for plating, and then we're going to thicken the sauce that's remaining. 
try to get it nice and clean. We're going to strain out those aromatics so we can thicken just the sauce. If you were at home, you could serve this straight up with everything inside of it. And in fact, the little bits of cooked garlic and scallion are going to taste quite nice. Um, but we do want a nice clean presentation today because we are doing it for the camera. Set this aside. Strain off this liquid. Quickly rinse out this pot, right? Back on the heat. Liquid going back into the pot. Here's the remaining sauce out of all of that liquid. The reason why we're re reducing just this sauce is because the daikon is going to flavor the cooking liquid as well, so we want that incorporated into the final sauce. This looks pretty typical for what's called a red braised sauce. As I mentioned before, it is not bright red, it is not uh, crayon red <laughs> like this pot, but it is red in the sense that it has color. There's a long history um, in uh, Chinese culture of the color red being also in and of itself a metaphor for all color. So when we're oftentimes chefs will say, hey, we need a little bit of color in this dish. What they mean in their heads is red, but also what they mean is this sort of glossy brownness. Now to thicken this sauce, once again, we have a starch slurry. This starch slurry is cornstarch with water. As always, I prefer potato starch, but we're going to add it in batches just to thicken our sauce almost to a glazed consistency. It's important that our sauce is boiling hot before we add the starch, otherwise it's not gonna to come together. We want all those fats and that liquid to emulsify. So to the pot, we're going to add our starch slurry. We want this to come back to heat before we add any more. Chinese tradition, try to add them in three bursts, but really that's mostly to give yourself an opportunity to watch how thick it gets before you add a little bit more. So I'm looking for something that coats the back of the spoon. I wanted to drape over that daikon quite nicely, and I think I'm almost there. So last step, off the heat, we have the thickness we want. Give it a couple touches of oil. That's going to give it the gloss that we want. There you go, nice and shiny. Better to do it off the heat after you've reached the consistency with the slurry. Nice and shiny. Cool. Braised icon oftentimes on its own is a bit of a side dish next to some braised meat dish. But I think this sauce plus this daikon is flavorful enough to stand on its own. I wouldn't say that this is the only thing that you'd eat over rice. As always with most Chinese food, it's nice in a concert, in a bit of a banquet with everything else. Sauce is going to go over the top. This is our nice sauce. Try to make sure that it's nice and smooth. It's a glaze and we want to see that color. So be generous. Nick is here to taste test a recipe that she's already tested before. You did this last week, right? Yes, I did. And? It's one of my favorite recipes. There you have it. It looks similar to when we actually tested it, right? Oh yeah, definitely. Okay. Except, Just the plating is a little bit obnoxiously. I mean, your plating looks gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> Mine was kind of like out of the pot, let's eat it right away situation. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, here, go ahead. So what are we looking for? We're looking for nice, tender daikon. Comes apart easily. No need for a fork and a knife. Wow. Flavor through and through. Look at that. Good. It's a radish. So it's cooked buttery vegetable root. The only thing that comes to mind in terms of describing what it tastes like is an even more obscure vegetable. <laughs> what? Um, I like it's a cooked celery act. <laughs> you know it does I mean? taste like cooked celery act. Yeah. I think this is a great entree in lieu of pork belly, which is, oh, I totally forgot to mention that. Red braised is traditionally made with pork belly. Pork belly, nice and tender. We're getting a similar, not a replicatory effect, but it's inspired by its texture. If you want the written recipe, the recipe is in the description box below. If you like daikon, if this looks good to you, let us know in the comments. Also, let us know if this recipe works for you as well as it did for the two of us. If you're interested in more vegetable recipes, we have amazing ones on our Why It Works series, including a grilled vegetables a dish that is perfect for the barbecue, one of my favorites. We'll see you in the next episode.